Hi guys, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York and today I wanted to do a quick video on the subject of blood clots. Now I've already tried doing this once and I'm really sorry if you uh, if you were following me on the previous one but somehow the computer malfunctioned and I've had to do it again. Um, but I hope this will be better. And now I'm really sorry I haven't spoken to you uh, for a while. It's just been the work has been overwhelming. But then um, I noticed that, um, you know, uh, less and less people are watching the videos and I thought I'd start getting back into it. So I'm going to pull my finger out and do some more videos for everyone. But I'd be really grateful if you could keep watching. Um, okay. So I wanted to talk to you about blood clots. And the reason I wanted to talk to you about blood clots is for several reasons. One, they are extremely common. Two, they are extremely dangerous. Three, they can occur without warning. And four, there are certain things you can do to try and reduce your likelihood of getting them. Okay. Now, blood clots are extremely common. All right. Unfortunately, um, they're given different names and therefore we don't automatically put it together when we hear a complex diagnosis that actually the ultimate underlying problem was a blood clot. So we know of people who have deep vein thrombosis, DVTs, they're obviously blood clots. We hear about people who've had a clot in their lung, pulmonary embolism. But what we don't know is that the majority of heart attacks are due to blood clots. The majority of strokes are due to blood clots. Um, uh, <clears throat> and the problem with blood clots is this, that they can form extremely quickly, in some ways as quickly as uh, blood takes to clot. Okay, so if you cut yourself and you start bleeding and you press on the, on the thing, on, on your hand and the blood clots, well, that as quickly, um, and that happens very quickly and that is, exactly how it happens when a blood clot, a dangerous blood clot forms. It can form that quickly. And before it's formed, there are no signs. And once it's formed and it's causing a problem, it can be devastating. And the problem with blood clots is that when they form, they actually can obstruct the flow of blood past them, right? So, um, and by doing so, they are stopping oxygen-rich blood from getting to where it needs to get to. This is particularly true for those clots which form in our arteries. When we hear about people who've had clots in their legs, we're thinking of clots that happen in their veins. But the bigger worry is the clots that happen in the arteries, okay? Because the arteries take oxygen-rich blood to the vital organs. And if an artery is obstructed, if the blood flow is obstructed by a sudden blood clot forming, then that oxygen-rich blood will not get to its destination, which means that the destination, i.e. the vital organ, be that the brain or the heart or the kidneys, will therefore start suffocating because it's no longer getting oxygen-rich blood and it will start eventually dying. Okay. And the longer the blood clot remains, the more damage will affect the organ at the destination. Uh, and if the blood clot persists for a very long time, then that can actually mean death of the whole organ, which can sometimes be very often be incompatible with life. And therefore, blood clots are really, really risky and also very common. Okay. A few other things to understand about blood clots is because of these different complex um, names they're given, when a blood clot forms in a place and causes an obstruction there and then, it's called a thrombus. Okay, So it forms in an area and it stops the blood from getting through, causes an obstruction, that's called a thrombus. And you may have heard of people who have coronary thrombosis, which means a blood clot has formed in their coronary arteries okay or cerebral thrombosis where people have had a blood clot form in their cerebral in their in their brain vessels a stroke uh, sometimes what can happen is a blood clot may form but it may not be big enough to cause an obstruction where it has formed but it can certainly get dislodged 
And as most blood vessels will start developing branches and smaller branches, the blood clot can move until it gets to that point where it's big enough to cause an obstruction and where it gets lodged into a blood vessel, that's where it'll cause the obstruction. That is called an embolism rather than thrombosis because it has moved from where it was created and is causing its obstruction somewhere else. So you may have heard of words like pulmonary embolism, coronary embolism, cerebral embolism. But basically the idea is the same. It's a blood clot and it's stopping blood from getting through to where the blood is needed the most. Okay. Now, <laughs> it is really important to try and understand why blood clot forms, but why blood clots form, because if you understand why they form, then you'll understand why some of the things that affect us predispose us to blood clots and how changing our lifestyle can reduce our likelihood of blood clots forming. Now, there was a very um, intelligent, distinguished professor, German professor in the 19th century called uh, Professor Virchow. And he worked out that there were three main factors that caused blood clots to form. Okay. And it's a combination usually of these three factors. So, of course, if you have one factor, you're, like, you're more likely than if you didn't have any of these factors. But if you have a combination of more than one factor, if you had two factors or three factors, then you were significantly more likely to develop blood clots. So what are these factors? The first factor is that if your blood is in some way abnormal, okay, more coagulable, more likely to clot, for whatever reason, thicker, then um, you are more likely to develop a blood clot. If your blood is in some way abnormal and more likely to clot because you've inherited a mutation or because of some of the other things I'm going to go into, then it's more likely to clot. So that's factor number one. The second factor is if the blood is not moving as much as it should, then it's more likely to clot. Of course, you know, when we, for example, bleed, we try and stem the flow of blood because we know that by stemming the flow of blood, you're increasing the likelihood of it clotting. And so if there is stasis or the blood is not moving as much, then it's more likely to clot. And the third thing is if the vessel wall, the vessel in which the blood is moving, is in some way damaged and it is affecting the streamlined flow of blood, okay, so the blood flow is not as smooth, because um, the blood vessel is craggy from within or um, um, in some way narrowed, then the blood um, will not go through as quickly, but also that cragginess or that um, lack of smoothness of the surface of the blood vessel will predispose the blood to clot. Okay, so three things. Number one, if your blood is abnormal and more likely to clot anyway. Number two, if the blood is not moving. And number three, if the vessel in some way is damaged, then you are much more likely to develop blood clots. All right. Now, let's look at some of the common reasons why um, blood clots form and in, in our lives and what our lifestyle, how our lifestyle can predispose us to some of these blood clots forming, okay? The first thing is age, all right? Let's see what age does. Well, number one, if you're, as you get older, your blood gets thicker. It's more likely to clot. If you, as you get older, you become more sedentary, so your blood is not moving as much. And as you get older, you do get hardening of your heart arteries, your brain arteries, and all the arteries. So your blood vessels are more damaged. So you're much more likely to develop clots as you get older. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about getting older. But um, those people, those of you who suffer from atrial fibrillation, for example, and they always talk about the risk of strokes with atrial fibrillation, will remember that age is a very important part of the risk stratification. The older you are, the higher your risk is. And number two, smoking. Okay, If you're smoking, then that smoking causes our blood to get thicker, it affects our blood coagulability, and it also damages our blood vessels. It causes hardening of the arteries, and therefore smoking is very dangerous. If you're older and you smoke, you're at a much higher risk. Okay, and Let's look at some of the other things. Lack of exercise. If you're not exercising, 
then obviously your blood is not moving as much. You know, if you're leading a very sedentary life, that is why people who are overweight, who are not exercising very much, are at a much higher risk of developing heart attacks and strokes. Number four, anything that causes inflammation within your body. So things like stress, things like lack of sleep, things like bad food, which has got lots of sort of preservatives and God knows what else they put in our foods these days before it even ends up on our tables. All those things will increase inflammation. And the problem with inflammation is that not only does it thicken our blood, but it also affects our vessel walls and it makes our arteries harder. And that's why inflammation is a big risk for the development of blood clots. And therefore, lack of sleep is a huge risk. Um, stress is a risk. Bad food is a risk. A sedentary lifestyle is a risk. Smoking is a risk. Other things, the oral contraceptive pill, because it's, it contains hormones, it contains estrogen, that thickens our blood. Uh, <clears throat> menopause, um, uh, and um, also there are other things, like some cancers can do it. Um, some people are unfortunately born with mutations in their blood, which makes the blood thicker. So they may have something like factor V laden deficiency or protein C, protein S deficiency, etc. But basically, the more the risk factors, uh, the more likely you are to have a complication of blood clots. And therefore, it is very, very important to maintain a really healthy lifestyle. Because if you do maintain a healthy lifestyle, then you are much less likely to develop clots later on. So the first and foremost thing I would recommend is exercise. Exercise is uh, always good. It's anti-inflammatory and it reduces the stasis of blood. I, it makes, allows the blood to move quicker in the body. So that's an easy thing to do. Number two, good sleep. Okay, Reduce the inflammation associated with a lack of sleep. Insomnia is very common. Sleep apnea is very common. And treating those and making sure that you're sleeping well and you're not only getting good quality sleep, but um, good volume of sleep and high quality sleep is really important. Minimizing your stress levels is really important. And most people these days are stressed. And it's really important to be cognizant of that and use stress relieving um, uh, uh, mechanisms to try and minimize the stress in your life. Um, eating good food, healthy food, food which is free of excessive amounts of sugar, excessive amounts of caffeine, excessive amounts of um, a refined or a refinement or processing is always a good thing. A lot of people these days are magnesium deficient and magnesium is really important because magnesium keeps the blood nice and thin. It keeps all the blood vessels nice and open. It reduces inflammation. And so magnesium has lots of good effects on this. And therefore, there is anecdotal data that people who have um, uh, good magnesium levels don't develop as much heart disease as people who have uh, very low magnesium level. This is anecdotal. You can't actually imply a causative thing, but there is an association there. And it's easily done, you know, paying attention to diet, taking magnesium supplementation may well help you. Um, and then, and, and that's really about it, you know, trying to, trying to just maintain a really good lifestyle uh, is the best thing you can do to minimize your risk of clots. Of course, don't smoke. Of course, if you are, uh, if you're on the pill, definitely don't smoke because you don't want to introduce two or three different things that could predispose you to blood clots. All right. So I hope this was useful. Uh, I'm going to do a video shortly on why people who have atrial fibrillation shouldn't stop um, their anticoagulation when they're out of atrial fibrillation, which follows on nicely from this video. So I will do that shortly. Uh, but in the meanwhile, this was the title of my talk, a bit late now, but <laughs> all right. This is my email address. If you need to get in touch with me, ask me any questions, please send me an email. I'm sorry I haven't been answering recently. It's just I've been so busy, but I am going to really make an effort to try and answer your queries. Uh, this is my email address and my Facebook page. And this is my website. 
So thank you so much for listening. And uh, uh, I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you so much. Bye.